Very good morning to everyone. <clears throat> so today I'll be doing the analysis of fourth uh, of October, the Hindu. And this is the fourth of October edition at your screen. I have shared it. Okay. Okay, if you uh, see the very first page, you find that <coughs> there's a news. News regarding the news click founder arrested under UAPA. So uh, by that way, uh, UAPA becomes important for your GS paper too, and also for your ethics paper. So you should know about UAPA. <clears throat> and what is UAPA? UAPA is Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. So for that reason, you should know about UAPA, you should know about the uh, clauses, and you should know about the article. Uh, now when I come to go for the deeper analysis, <clears throat> So I come to this section, uh, page number nine, that is uh, <coughs> using AI for audit techniques. Now, if you go with uh, the deeper analysis of uh, this uh, article, what do you find? Now, they say that the controller, the CAC, who is the uh, chair for the Supreme Audit Institutions of the G20, want that absolute dependence on AI for 
auditing purposes may lead to inaccurate finding emphasize ethics as the cornerstone for responsible ai so um, what have they said that if you are going to get <clears throat> absolute dependent and absolute dependent on who absolute dependent on ai that is artificial intelligence so they are saying that this uh, will lead to what inaccurate findings inaccurate findings and emphasize ethics as a cornerstone of responsible ai the cat uh, conducts what now you should know about uh, uh, what is a cat responsible for so cat conducts <clears throat> financial audits compliance audits performance audits the auditing challenge of ai includes what um it ensuring transparency objectivity fairness and avoiding bias so responsible ai must be ethical and inclusive so they are the, the author is saying that uh, a responsible uh, artificial intelligence is one which is ethical and inclusive so only ai can add credibility trust scalability to the cag audit so data sets must be complete <clears throat> and gathered on time accurate available and relevant so if <clears throat> integrity of the data field is not ensured we will have inaccurate audit findings so for having accurate findings you should have what the data must be complete gathered on time accurate available and relevant so the ai auditor must be extra vigilant about the risk of inherent ai data <clears throat> bias if data are taken from unauthorized sources like social media where data manipulation and fabrication are common now what they're saying is that uh, if you are going to rely on the data which is coming from a social media that means the data from the social media is most of the time what <clears throat> fabricated or manipulated now india needs ai regulation so the european parliament approved the eu ai act the first of its kind in the world how the act ensures that generative ai tools such as chat gpt will be placed under greater restrictions and scrutiny developers will have to submit their system for review and approval before releasing them commercially parliament also prohibited real time biometric surveillance from all public settings and social scoring systems <clears throat> now ensuring the accuracy of vast internet internet data mines is a challenge now um if you uh, have a little bit idea of uh, you know how the system is operating and how data is becoming very crucial because it's very 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 crucial um it will, it will become very difficult you know to um, secure the data and that is what the author is also saying that in the present moment um if you want Uh, your data to be secure it's a vast challenge so first you need to talk about what uh, you need to secure your internet data the content generated by ai system may lead to potential copyright infringement issues so first issue that they are talking about is uh, copyright infringement issues <clears throat> copyright <coughs> infringement issues then you have uh, issues regarding your intellectual property rights so violating intellectual property rights
then you have addressing legal implications relating to content ownership is a formidable task that means uh, uh, who is going to be the owner of the content that means content ownership is again becoming a big task AI bias is an inherent risk of uh, originating from human bias that is added to the data sets of machine learning. So Elon Musk wa wants to address these concerns by developing Truth GPT, a maximum truth seeking AI. His vision of harmonious fusion of technological progress and ethical consideration possesses significant challenge. A multifaceted approach may be required to mitigate bias and ensure the safety and accuracy of AI models. So, here uh, there is another thing that is going to come into the market that is your truth GPT, so that maximum truth could be reached out could be seeked <clears throat> fine now what's going to happen uh, challenges before the cat <clears throat> The CAD faces many challenges in the auditing AI system. AI regulations and data standardizations are critical. So um, <clears throat> one important thing which is very really, uh, crucial over there, data standardization are critical. Since the data for various government entities are taken from different sources and stored in multiple divergent platforms, the AI auditor will face enormous risks and challenges. So audits cannot be... <clears throat> used on big data from unauthorized sources. So data integration and cross-referencing becomes uh, cumbersome. Now, what do that they mean? Uh, see, for example, uh, the data from different, different sources are coming. So integration of data becomes difficult. And then they are saying that cross-referencing, that means if you are going to check so that referencing becomes so difficult. So data platform of all entities must be synchronized through the government's IT policies. Now, according to CAG, one Indian audit accounts department, one system, a web-enabled IT application is going to support multiple languages, offline functionality, mobile app enabling, complete digitalization of the audit process. <clears throat> what else they are saying at present auditors can only adopt and adapt existing frameworks and regulations relating to it uh, what else they are saying that the national audit institution need to communicate with all the stakeholders the existing definition and taxonomies of ai must be examined to adopt <coughs> what is legally acceptable. Since there is a wide variance among AI systems and solutions, the auditor must adopt an appropriate AI design and architecture while defining the audit's objective, scope, criteria and methodology. Now see what is happening is uh, the very important thing what they are talking about is that if you are going to uh, you know audit through AI, firstly you need to check on to what uh what the credibility of your data this becomes very important because uh, the author is constantly saying that uh, the ai design or the architecture is in a manner where uh, they are taking into reference the objectivity of the data you are having now where or how are you you know going to talk about or like what are the references based on which you are going to say whether your data is accurate or not because once see once if you are going to have a good data with you uh, that could be audited well there won't be any issue with a uh, like, with respect to that so what need to be done is uh, there need to be capacity building of auditors in varied aspects of AI technology. In the next one, in the um, uh, absence of explicit AI auditing guidance, auditors must focus on ethics, use authentic data sources to ensure what transparency, address legal concerns and look at deficiencies in IT controls and governance. AI audit assignments may require consultation with data scientists, data engineers, data architects, programmers, and AI specialists. Now, AI outsourcing to third parties while using cloud computing. 
implies the risk of third parties having control of infrastructure. AI domain risks such as big data, machine learning, and cyber security must be documented in our risk and control matrix. So, uh, whatever uh, the author has talked about here, now these are some upcoming technologies that is your big data, your uh, machine learning. That means your uh, machines are, uh, you know, programmed in a manner that they have learned the task they have to perform. And then they have cyber security. <clears throat> okay, so all this that they are talking about, now this should be uh, documented in a manner so as to control the risk. Now, compliance issue, where is the issue coming from? So, global organizations have developed many AI auditing frameworks. These include COVID network. And what is that? For AI audit, the US Government Accountability Office frameworks, the uh, COSOM framework, UK's Information Commissioner's Office has published draft guidance on AI auditing framework. So, data protection, impact assessment are legally required if organizations use AI system that process personal data to avoid potential risk. That means if, if uh, for case in any way uh, there is any potential risk or you think that, okay, this could be the risk. So that risk could be avoided. How? By having an access to the personal data. The AI auditor must ensure that personal data is processed in a manner that guarantees appropriate level of security. So they say that appropriate level of security must be there. Now, with few frameworks available for auditing, AI auditors can only focus on risks, controls, and governance structures that are in place to determine whether they are operating effectively or not. So now if <coughs> I go on to, uh, you know, if I summarize, then uh, what will I say that uh, uh, what, what, what actually has happened is that uh, India's CAG has warned on absolute dependence on AI for auditing process. So just uh, let me give you the gist of this article. Just hold on for a second. <coughs> okay, so if I uh, go with uh, the gist, like uh, what has uh, or what was the article all about? So the article was all about what that there was okay just a second okay so the article was this article was all about what india's uh, CAG has done what now they have one one for what absolute dependence on ai And uh, for, with respect to what? For auditing purposes. Now, uh, there was another term that came here was SAI. <coughs> and what is that? That is Supreme Audit Institutions. <clears throat> now, if I ask you, what is uh, the Supreme Audit Institutions? So, Supreme Audit Institutions are, these are public bodies. Now, what are these public bodies? Now, they are responsible for the audit of government's revenue and expenditure. So, uh, you can say that uh, they are public bodies and uh, these bodies are responsible for government's or audit of government's revenue and expenditure.
Now, um, if they are going, these bodies are going to audit. What is going to happen now? Uh, by they they will audit all this by scrutinizing the public financial management and reporting. They provide assurance that resources are used as prescribed. That means uh, when the audit is going to happen, um, after scrutinizing, what are they going to do? They are going to report. And what will they report? That means everything that uh, you know uh, that is being used or uh, the financial management for that matter this financial management is with respect to what this financial management or they are going to provide you with the assurance that the financial management is exactly what it was <clears throat> prescribed so finance financial management was accurate so the report will talk about the financial management's accuracy <clears throat> and uh, now the big question comes that uh, if uh, they are public bodies and they are auditing government's revenue and expenditure and they are scrutinizing the reports of financial management accuracy, then where are they, you know, deriving their power and all? So they are coming from the legislation <clears throat> or the constitution. Okay, so uh, then you can talk about the challenges that are coming on your way with respect to AI because objectivity is not there. Um, there's a potential threat, potential threat with respect to what? <clears throat> that how much uh, fairness and biasness will be there. So with respect to that, you can talk about all this now. Um, you can also talk about the challenges because uh, they have highlighted the same. They have talked about uh, the limited access. They have talked about uh, the issues with the capacity building. They have also talked about uh, how the data accumulation is going to take place, how uh, you are going to uh, you know, access the data because um, if, if it is fabricated data, if it is manipulated through social media, then it is very difficult to actually uh, check onto the data. So all this will be the potential threats. Okay. Now, if I move on to the next article, the next article is your circular migration. Circular migration, looking at both sides of the debate in India, internal migration, which is migration within a particular country or state has almost always been circular. With rapid industrialization, there has been a huge flow of migrants from rural areas to urban cities. So one reason they are uh, talking about is rapid industrialization. And because of rapid industrialization, what is happening? Huge flow of migrants is happening from rural areas to urban cities. Now, if I go with this, then uh, what is uh, happening? So <clears throat> now um, you can ask me that uh, how is uh, this uh, circular migration different from a normal migration or uh, for that matter why what is the need to study uh, circular migration uh, when we are having uh, this uh, normal migration so wh what is the need so we do what is circular migration now if you see uh, circular migration is a repetitive form of migration when people move to another place that is a destination country and back that means the country of origin so if this is your country of origin <clears throat> And uh, this is your destination country. <coughs> so what is happening is that people move from here to here and then people move from. So people move to another place that is your destination and back to the origin according to the availability of. So this is based on what this is based on the availability of employment
okay so <clears throat> this effectively means that instead of migrating permanently or temporarily uh, to another location people move to different location from a brief period of time when work is available that means uh, as long as there is availability of work <coughs> so as long as there is availability of work people are migrating see uh, now uh, if you have a little bit idea that uh, how people are migrating so uh, let me give you an example for example if uh, there is a seasonal employment seasonal employment for that matter means what um, at a certain place for a certain period of time if uh, there is like a need for people or the need for uh, a manpower what is going to happen is that they are going to recruit or they are going to uh, make those people work for them and uh, after that time say two three four months what happens is once the work is over these people now again migrate back to their origin country oh, sorry origin place so what is happening now this is referred to as circular migration <coughs> now what is the definition of circular migration circular migration becomes uh, quite popular in the 60s and 70s with the advent of globalization and development increased access to modern forms of transport communication social networks and growth of multinational corporations have added the advent of circular migration that means uh, you can say industrialization you can say uh, modernity you can say increase in social networks you can also say what multinational corporations and then sees now all these factors have contributed towards your circular migration <coughs> Fine. However, only recently uh, the phenomena being seen is due to the seasonal movement of migrants. This is exactly what I have said because of seasonal employment. Now, according to Phillips Fargus, uh, migration can be defined as circular if it meets the following criteria. That means uh, they have defined the criteria of circular migration. This could be a prelims question also that there is a temporary residence in. <clears throat> destination location, uh, location there is possibility of multiple entries into destination country there is freedom of movement between the country of origin and country of destination during the period of residence now there is legal right to stay in the destination country there is protection of migrants right and if there is healthy demand for temporary labor in destination country so if there is a uh, healthy demand for temporary labor in the destination country but still uh, some doubt remain like uh, what are those doubts so <clears throat> how many times does a migrant have to move between countries as per the reports on measuring circular migration by united nations economic commission for europe task force one is called a circular migrant if you have completed at least two loops between two countries that means two loops between uh, two countries now what they are saying consider country a and consider country b if you move from a to b and back to a uh back to it then you are a return migrant so this one way cycle is known as return migrant now if you move from a to b b to a and then again to b that means a to b b to a and then again to b uh, you have completed two loops between two countries and can be considered as circular migrant. So one is your return migrant and once again you go to B, then you are known as circular migrant. This can become more complicated if more than two countries are involved. So what is going to happen if uh, say if C is also involved? So uh, then this becomes complicated. So in short, if your primary destination is the country of origin, if you move periodically between the two countries for the purpose of economic advancement, such as employment, businesses, etc., <coughs> you can be considered a circular migrant.
Now, what is public policy with the increasing uh, fluid movement of people? Policy around migration is one of the biggest debates in the world. The movement of citizens from global south to west in search of more employment opportunities or better standard of living creates brain drain for their origin countries and competition for the citizens of destination countries. That means, uh, see, uh, this is very simple if you go. Uh, now, this is your origin country. So, if the person is going from A to B, that means uh, there is a condition of brain drain. Now, this brain drain condition is happening. Now, similarly, if the person moves from B to A, what is happening? Now, this condition is referring to what? Now, this condition uh, is creating, uh, sorry, if uh, the person is uh, moving from A to B, it is a condition of brain drain. Now, if the person is staying here in B, it is going to create a very stiff competition for the people over there in the destination country. So here the person will be, there will be intense competition and here there will be a brain drain. Now, similarly, the flow of people moving from rural areas to more urban areas of the same country results in the breakdown of infrastructure and agrarian stagnation. So, there is a condition of brain drain and at the same time, what you are going to witness is the condition of <coughs> distress agrarian economy. distress agrarian economy and breakdown of infrastructure. However, circular migration is now seen as the best way forward as needs of development and individual economic advancement can be balanced out. It is seen as a balanced migration method which looks at migration not only from the point of view of receiving country but also of sending nations. So for the country of origin migration, especially the international migration is beneficial to the flow of remittances which will boost and aid the domestic economy. So if the person is moving from the origin country to the destination country and now again i'm saying it is a country so what is going to happen is there will be flow of <coughs> remittances <coughs> very absolutely correctly pointed out that there will be flow of remittances then if there's flow of remittances what is going to happen there is flow of foreign capital as well. And when there is flow of foreign capital, this will enhance economy ensuring what? More infrastructure, more jobs, there will be more associations, there will be better standard of living, etc. <coughs> now, however, uh, a large scale transnational migration will also lead to brain drain when most talented people of your country will use the intellect and innovation for the advancement of another country. Um, from the perspective of the host country, especially those of the West, a lesser population and a higher access to education has resulted in a larger dearth of low income, low skill jobs which migrants have been able to fill. However, the influx of migrants have caused a wide range of anxieties cultural conflicts in the host population with most of them now calling for restrictions and outright ban for migration. So, but they are going to face world competition. Uh, and uh, what is going to happen now? There is a large dearth of low income people, low skill jobs, etc. So, what is going to happen there? They are demanding what? Ban to migration. Now, circular mig uh, migration aims to quell all these fears. The negative effects of brain drain will reduce a sort of brain circulation will be encouraged when the individual can use his talent in both countries and still contribute to remittances. Now, they have said that uh, uh, brain drain can be checked how where the individual could actually move on to, can actually work for the origin country also and for the destination country also and by doing so what will happen they will reduce brain drain 
and at the same time they are going to contribute towards what remittances most importantly ronald skelden put it in the paper that managing migration for development is circular migration circular migration offers a way out to the government of destination countries as migrants will circulate back to their homes now this is uh, i have just discussed now um if i go with this like uh, <clears throat> how uh, what what is uh, uh, the need for circular migration so you can say uh, shortfall of labor is there one then you can say remittances are provided to uh, three you can also say that um, the negatives of brain drain can be tackled how because uh, then there is a workforce that is going to come or adjust for the people who have actually left now uh this is a case study of circular migration within india so you can read it and uh, depending upon your optional paper you can use this case study fine now at the end of the day as uh, amrita datta in her paper said that circular migration and precarity that is the perspectives from rural bihar says in destination areas rural or urban circular migrants remain at the margins of physical social cultural and political spaces it is high time that states start actively formulating policy to understand the extent of circular migration some states like kerala have announced health insurance schemes for migrant workers that is awal health Scheme. Now you should remember the Samal Health Scheme. There need to be more effort to ensure migrant rights. The precarity of workers need to be addressed, and there should be more efforts to integrate them in destination states. So uh, indeed, it was a very beautiful article. Um, but you should know about the differences between uh, migration, circular migration. Then I told you there is. Uh, again uh, the term that is related to uh, this migration circular migration uh how how two loops of migration are uh, is going to be considered as circular migration now <clears throat> okay so we have done with circular migration now let's move on to the next analysis okay so uh, this is page number 16 and the business analysis uh this becomes important why why because the manufacturing pmi slips to 5 months low uh you should know about uh, pmi firstly and what is pmi this is purchasing managers index India's manufacturing activity eased to a five-month low, uh, with new orders slowing down as per the seasonally adjusted uh, global Indian manufacturing purchasing measures index, which slid to 57.5 from 58.6. Now, while input cost inflation slowed to the lowest in more than three years, firm raised output charges at a sharper pace than. the long run average which could hurt sales prospect going forward so manufacturers cited higher labor cost now what have the manufacturers uh, pointed out so manufacturers have talked about higher labor cost higher labor cost combined with upbeat business that means uh, the labor cost is increasing plus there is a beat business confidence and buyer demand as the rational for the price increases in september now what they are saying is that the growth of new export orders softened from uh, august 
and uh, this is the reason and this is a report that is coming from where global market intelligence uh, firms noted new business gains from clients in asia europe north america and middle east factories output rose at the slowest pace in five months <clears throat> now what are the signs of slowdown India's manufacturing industry showed mild signs of slowdown in September, primarily due to softer increase in uh, new order, which tempered production growth. Um, other than that, nevertheless, both demand and output saw significant upticks, and manufacturers held a strongly positive outlook for production. Now, upbeat forecasts continued to drive job creation efforts and initiatives to replenish the input stocks. Together, these indices point towards a favorable trajectory for India's manufacturing industry. However, the appreciable increase in output charges, despite receding cost pressures, uh, restrict sale in the coming months. So they are talking about what uh, the cost production and the restrict sale. Now, what you need to uh, note is that the manufacturing purchase, uh, sorry, the manufacturing purchasing managers index is based on five individual indexes now what is those five individual indexes uh, first you need to know about okay so if i go with the five manufacturing how you are going to calculate what manufacturing purchasing managers index now this is based on five individual indexes uh, first is your new orders and this new orders contribute to a 30 percent how much is your output? This output contributes to 25%. Then is your employment. This contributes to 20%. <clears throat> then is your supplier's delivery time. This contributes to 15%. Uh, Fifth one is your stock of items purchased. And this contributes to 10%. <coughs> now, if you add on, this is 30, this is 20, this is 50. Then you have this, this is 40, and this is 10, 50. That means the total is coming to 100%. Fine. Um, other than that, what you need to know over here is, um, yeah, only this much. Like, uh, what? why was it low? Uh, what are the contributing factors towards it? That's it. Okay. Uh, <coughs> Now let's move on to the next analysis. Okay, so we have done circular migration. Um, we have done AI for audit techniques. Okay, uh, now we are going to do this one. Uh, what is the, what is it? Uh, that is the trouble with a noble for mRNA COVID vaccines. <laughs> 
okay so we shall start with this now uh, why or what is the need to do this uh, article that means uh, we are going to talk about the nobel prize for physiology or medicine which has been awarded to katalin uh, carico and drew wilson for developing the mra mrna vaccine technology this article becomes important for your prelims to the science and tech portion and also for your uh, uh, mains again from science and technology portion and also for ethics purpose as well now that became the foundation for history's fastest vaccine development program during the covid-19 vaccine uh, sorry covid-19 pandemic the prize acknowledges work that has uh, created benefits for all mankind but if we had to be stricter about holding scientific and club accomplishments up to this standard the subset of mrna vaccine used during covid-19 pandemic may not meet it yet dr kariko and dr wisman and others deserve to win the prize for their scientific accomplishments now uh, what what has happened uh, at the expense of the much of the knowledge that end up in most new drugs and vaccines is unearthed at the expense of government and public one this part of drug development is more risky and protracted when scientists identify potential biomolecular targets within the body on which a drug could act in order to manage a particular disease <clears throat> followed by identifying suitable chemical candidates companies subsequently commoditize and commercialize these identities raking in millions in profit typically at the expense of the same people who tax funded uh, the fundamental research now see what in india if you remember what was happening once this moderna and pfizer began producing their mrna covid-19 vaccines they were also mired in north america and the european countries zeal to make sure they had more than enough for themselves before allowing the manufacturers to export them to the rest of the world that means uh, there should be sufficient for their own uh, country before exporting it to the others so the triumph of the catherine carico and drew wisman tells us something important about the world in which science happens and what for all mankind should really mean now on covax covax the program to ensure poorer countries did not become the victim of the subpar purchasing power and sufficient stocks of mrna fell far short of its target india russia and china exported billions of doses of their vaccine but their exports were all beset by concern that manufacturing capacity had been overestimated in india's case that means there was a, a kind of um, prediction prediction regarding what that there would be uh, <coughs> more of uh, demand of vaccine uh, from india which uh, was uh, over exaggerated right so uh, what happened was like from the experience of the covid what we have learned that there was a lot of uh, vaccine that was accumulated by the developed nations and uh, during the covax initiative when it came it was uh, thought that uh, there would be more demand which uh, ultimately didn't happen that way now uh, what they are saying is uh, this was your covax study now corby vax a counter example to the path that dr kaibo followed is corbax uh, researchers at the this this uh, respective what, what did they do? see they did not patent it in february 2022 tech, uh, texas politicians wrote a letter nominating the vaccine developer for a nobel prize for peace for their work to develop and distribute a low cost covid-19 vaccine to people of the world without patent limitation so what ultimately like what is the thrust of the article we cannot blame a scientist for trying to profit from their work the mrna vaccine story during covid-19 pandemic simply plays an extraordinary premium on altruism on their part a result of administrators boss decisions the technology could have benefited everyone during the pandemic but it did not do so so history should remember what actually happened during the pandemic and what the 2023 medicine nobel claim happened differently so uh, the author is trying to say what uh, what actually happened and what was uh, trying to 
or what actually the scenario was there there was a difference difference with respect to what that there was uh, double the spending of the public and there was a lot of uh, profit motive of uh, the pharma company so there is a lesson that need to be learned uh, what uh, this lesson is uh, that that means uh, the entire uh, people or uh, the uh, people around the world could have been benefited had uh, this thing not being overestimated, estimated regarding what that, uh, you know, there's a disruption with respect to the supply and demand market. So that need to be studied and COVID-19 pandemic has uh, given or has taught this one lesson to us. So we need to think about it. Now, let's move on to the another analysis. <laughs> okay, so here it is. What uh, uh, Bill Agostini, Frank Cross, and Anne Lee Julio have been awarded the 2023 Physics Nobel Prize. Uh, from 1987, uh, uh, Julio found, explained, and refined the principles of producing attoseconds, light pulses, this is important. Electrons and matter move very fast, interacting on the order of a few hundred or attoseconds. Attosecond physics deals with ways to capture these interactions. Then you have Dr. Agostini, produce a series of pulses using these principles, each to 50 attosecond duration. Now, Dr. Cross uh, isolated a single pulse of 650 at a second duration. Using this, they measured the kinetic energy of a bunch of electrons emitted by uh, krypton atoms. So why is this important? At a second, physics provides scientists with the ability to look at the minutest um, particles at the shortest time scale. And at a second is one billionth of nanosecond. The Nobel, the Nobel laureates and developed experiments to produce ultra fast laser pulses which can be used to understand the world at really minute scale with applications across chemistry biology and physics the experimental development of short optical pulses has been intimately related to technical developments in laser technology so uh, this becomes important with respect to the uh, Nobel prize winners and uh, yeah okay so uh, there's one more thing that i'm short of time so what what you can do is that uh, uh this one <clears throat> nagorna and karabakh now, the, for past so many days, this news has been uh, there in newspapers. So, uh, just have a go through to this article to just know about the you know ethnic crisis that uh, is being there in this region. Fine. Uh, rest, I think I have covered all of it. Uh, what you just just go through this and uh, do a map analysis. Okay, so thank you so much. <laughs>